There you go, Dan. Okay, we seem to be having an issue again. Dan seems to be on mute. Uh, I'm not sure what that's what's happening there. So Dan, one more time, we'll try to get you off mute. And if uh, we're not able to, we'll just progress uh, with the call. Okay, he's still on mute. Well, welcome everybody. This is the May coordinator call. And, uh, and we're really happy that you could join us today. We have a very full agenda, as you see. And uh, we're starting off with a, with a person that I'm really glad hey, that- this uh, is Dan, I can't hear. Dang. Okay, Dan, um, I'm going to- Are you talking? Yes, I'm texting you. Okay. Well, sorry folks that we're having these issue. So what we're going to do is go ahead and move forward with our with our first agenda item because this is a very important one. Uh, we're talking about the July 1 federal regulations that are to become effective. Uh, you know that we were these were released back in November and uh, they've been on um, an institution could choose to have already uh, implemented these July 1 um, regulations, but what we're going to talk about right now is there's been some questions about whether they're going to move forward and how should we uh, be addressing these regulations. So Caitlin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And just for the sake of the technology check, can you hear me all right? Yes, you sound great. For those of you that don't know Caitlin, Caitlin Shelby is our wonderful colleague um, with Cooley LLP. Uh, she's an attorney there. She has uh, helped us in uh, advanced topics workshops and on the virtual seminar. She's a terrific colleague, and we are really grateful that she could take the time today to speak to us. Well, thanks for that introduction, Cheryl. It's always great to uh, join my friends uh, at WCET, and it's my first coordinator call. So uh, thanks to all of you for, for having me as well. Um, it's great to take a little bit of time to, um, you know, touch base on the federal regulations. Um, you know, I'm sure that everyone has a lot on their plates right now, uh, personally and professionally, and it can be a little bit difficult to find ways to uh, interact and keep on task, um, especially when you have, um, you know, something before you like these new regulations and coming into compliance with them that you know, probably really requires um, quite a bit of teamwork and engagement from different levels of institution, from, um, you know, from your general counsel's office, um, you know, from, from folks who are you know, familiar with the program curriculum to administrators. Um, you know, I really think compliance here is, a, is an all hands on deck situation. And I know that this group always, um, always takes uh, these regulations you know, uh, seriously and really understands um, not only the, the nuts and bolts, but also the bigger picture. So it's, uh, it's great to be, um, to be with this group and to uh, dialogue more with folks who um, really have their arms around this uh, day to day. Um, you know, here to you today to, to talk about these regulations and to, you know, share my thoughts about, um, you know, timing and, and keeping the eye on the ball and to hone in on a few, um, you know, particular issues. Um, you know, clearly, uh, I'm an associate at, at Cooley, um, attorney by trade, um, here not today to provide, you know, uh, specific legal advice. You have, I'm sure, very smart people in your in, in counsel's office or other outside counsel um, that you'll you know really bounce things off of uh, before implementing um, but that said always happy to um, engage offline and kind of drill into um, any of these topics a little bit further um, so you know with that said it's not lost on me that uh, yesterday was memorial day uh, I, I don't know if anybody got up to much, but being in D.C., um, I stared out the window a lot and looked at the lovely weather, um, but didn't quite get out and engage. We're still uh, in quite a bit of a lockdown here until June 8th, so uh, it doesn't quite feel like the unofficial start of summer, um, but I suppose uh, it, it really is, which means that July 1st is right around the corner. Um, 
it's uh, it's really sneaking up on everyone, or at least sneaking up on me. And you know, I get the sense that a majority of of institutions, although you know there was an option to implement these regulations early, um, did not do so. So uh, I imagine that you know, in in addition to a number of other uh, issues that institutions are dealing with. Uh, you know, and related to COVID-19, related to the pandemic response and trying to be forward thinking to fall. Um, I also expect that institutions are really seeing that July 1st date circled on their calendar and wondering, you know, what it means for them and, and how they can best prepare. Um, you know, I think a question that's kind of floating around in the ether is, hey, is this July 1st date really going to be um, you know, the, the effective date. Um, is this really going to be the date when these regulations are, are, are finally going to take effect? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I wish I did, um, but I, you know, I, so I can't say for sure. And, you know, stranger things have happened, particularly in, you know, relation to state authorization regulations over the past, you know, what, four or so years now, um, you know, kind of a long history of, delays and uh, legal challenges and, you know, implementation kind of sneaking up on you. Um, but, you know, for, for purposes of these regulations, I, you know, it's, it's my thought that at, at any rate, um, it's important to, to act as though July 1 is going to be the date. Um, you know, I certainly haven't gotten the sense from the department and any of their other FAQs or, or guidance that's been issued that there's um, you know, a real push to can reconsider uh, the date. And it's, you know, in a different context. Um, and I don't, I don't know if anyone caught uh, Candace Jackson's NACUA presentation a couple weeks ago, but at least in connection with the, with the new Title IX regulations, um, you know, April, excuse me, April, oof, August 14th is, you know, the effective date for those regulations. And, you know, the, the department is, it seems quite inflexible on that deadline. Um, seems to be pretty certain that, you know, it, it set that expectation and that institutions need to be, you know, ready for that date. And, you know, again, different regulations, different contexts. Um, but I think that, you know, there is possibly some, you know, carryover too. Um, you know, when, when, when asked, you know, why the department was, you know, maybe not considering any flexibility in the Title IX effective date, um, you know, the response was something along the lines of, well, you've, you've had time, you, you knew these regulations were coming, and uh, you should have probably been working towards that in this time frame. And, you know, I think there's a little bit of that sentiment that kind of carries over into, into these, you know, federal regulations as well. Um, you know, negotiated rulemaking ended over a year ago, uh, believe it or not, the NPRN came out almost a year ago, and you know the department was pretty clear in the in the final rule that that, that finally came out that it, it was not interested in in implementing any sort of grace period or giving any flexibility for institutions to you know come into compliance, particularly with the professional licensure disclosures. And so I you know I, of course you know anything can happen. These are you know unprecedented times. If you aren't tired of hearing that phrase yet, um, you know, but they truly are. So, um, you know, maybe there will be, you know, some, you know, communication that comes down. But I, I really do think that, um, you know, it's it's in an institution's best interest to act as though July first, you know, is is going to be the the target and 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 to put, you know, plans and processes into action to be ready by that date. Um, you know, if, if an institution already has, you know, distance education offerings, you might have a little bit of a head start because maybe, you know, you've already been thinking about this, you know, specifically, um, you know, with your distance education programs, you know, prepare, prepare students for licensure. So, uh, you know, maybe there's already been some advanced work done. Um, and, and to those institutions that have, you know, early implemented or have, you know, really had a great head start or been chipping away at this, I think it's great. Maybe maybe July first is not that scary, um, but I think anytime you you know you see a deadline coming up, especially in light of uh, you know national and, and international turmoil, um, it's it's only natural to feel a little bit anxious about um, about being ready for that date. So you know, kind of beyond you know my general sense of of, of timing and just you know a 
a friendly reminder that, you know, among the million and five other things you have going on, this is one more thing uh, that requires your attention. Uh, I want to just touch on a few, uh, a few questions or a few areas that, you know, Cheryl and I kind of kicked around the other day and that I think, um, you know, I've certainly seen come up in, in other conversations and discussions and maybe some of these things have, have been on your mind too. Um, and, you know, particularly in, in the context of professional licensure disclosures. And, you know, I think one thing that, you know, obviously it's, it's one thing to, to read the rule and to understand, uh, you know, what the goal is, what the intent is, and it's an entirely different thing to actually try to uh, put this into action and, you know, formulate the disclosures that you need to formulate, um, do the very difficult research, uh, you know, coordinate, learn about these programs, um, all in the spirit of, of being, you know, precise and being accurate and, you know, providing the information that, you know, you need to provide um, and, and, and keeping the, you know, the students, you know, front of mind. And, you know, an area where I think, you know, as, as institutions dig in a little bit into the, the research that they need to do in order to really make these disclosures, assuming that, you know, you made the, the, the choice to go down that path and, and make a determination as to whether, uh, you know, a program meets the educational requirements for licensure and, and more specifically whether the, the curriculum of that program meets the requirements for licensure is, you know, how do I, you know, go from this research and, and put it into these categories? And I think, you know, a question that some institutions may have and something that some institutions may be considering and kind of making these categories and these determinations is, well, you know, here's a program where, okay, it does not meet all of the requirements for licensure in a state. You know, maybe the curriculum is, uh, or maybe it's a nursing program and your nursing program contains or includes, uh, you know, a certain number of clinical hours and, you know, covers a, a range of, of substantive topics. Um, but in a particular state, the state says, and there also needs to be, you know, three hours of pharmacology or something like that. Um, and you're looking at this and you're saying, hey, like we're doing pretty good here. We, our curriculum meets almost all of the requirements uh, for, for to qualify for licensure in this particular state. And I think, you know, the instinct there may be to say yes, because, you know, you feel like the program really does meet and, you know, check a lot of these boxes. Um, and then to, you know, disclose, you know, maybe the one area or the couple areas where, it's, you know, it's close, but, but not quite there. Um, and I like to think of that, you know, I think some, I think it's easy to frame that as a, a yes and, like, you know, yes, we meet the requirements and you need to keep these things in mind. Um, I think it's really a, a yes, but, right? So, you know, yes, the program meets these requirements, but not really. Um, and, and in thinking about, you know, if, if there's a, you know, a program or a situation like that, I think, you know, again, it's important to, to consider a, a couple things. And, and one is really whether this, you know, yes, but approach, uh, you know, is really compliant with the, with the intent and, and the spirit of the regulations, which is to provide, you know, very, uh, very discreet categories to provide, you know, concise and, and precise uh, categorizations and to take the burden off of the student. And so, you know, in a situation like that where you're saying, you know, yes, but not really, um, I think it's important to ask whether that really is, is compliant and is within the spirit of, of the regulations and whether that's providing the level of consumer protection and student protection that, that the department is, is aiming for with these categories. Um, and the second thing to think about is really, you know, a little bit more of a, a practical question from, um, you know, a, a risk standpoint, which is, you know, at, at the end of the day, what you are, are coming up with are, you know, how to fit, you know, the program within these, these three categories, this yes, no, or no determination. And, and that's really what you need to provide, right? Just, you know, it does, it doesn't, or we, we haven't checked, we haven't made the determination. And, you know, Anything beyond that, any additional information beyond that, 
um, you know, I, I think it, institutions should really consider whether it's worth, you know, potential, um, you know, risk of misrepresenting, um, you know, what's missing to provide that information. Um, I, I think, you know, it runs the risk of, of giving, um, uh, of giving the impression that uh, maybe the the school is working with that you know state board or state regulator to try to find a workaround. So um, we're almost there and we're getting there, which you know may or or, or may not be accurate. Um, but at any rate, I think you you know you do run the risk of you know unintentionally because I do think this comes from you know the best intentions um, unintentionally misleading someone when you're adding more information to that to that yes uh you know yes determination all in the name of you know really trying to you know be as accurate as possible but also you know really frame the program in a, in a more positive way and you know i'm very i'm very sympathetic to the optics of this because i think um it's human nature and i think it's also just um good business sense and um I think there's a lot of reasons why nobody ever wants to say no. Um, and in part because no also has, um, you know, other, um, other obligations that are, that are triggered with a no under these regulations. So, um, you know, I understand the, the inclination to, to move a no to a yes. Um, but, but I think, you know, from the department's perspective, I think you need to, it's important to remember that, um, you know, at least, you know, from, from the regulations and the way that they're crafted, the department doesn't view no as, as a bad answer, and it doesn't even view no determination as a bad answer. Um, I don't think there's that inherent judgment call built in from, from the department's perspective. Um, you know, I think from a, from a student-facing perspective, I, I, I understand why a no feels like the wrong answer. Um, but if you, you know, I think institutions are coming from a place from wanting to empower students and wanting to provide the right information. And I think if you continue to follow that thread, um, I think where you land is that if, you know, you can't really say yes and really check all boxes, then, then it's a no and you, you know, you, you attach those obligations attach and, you know, you're able to engage the student or the prospective student um, in a way that the department intended and that is meaningful to the student and, you know, meaningful to the institution and, and frankly, you know, protective for the institution. So I think, you know, that's kind of, you know, one area that I think is, as institutions are really trying to actually, you know, implement and from a practical standpoint, um, you know, put these regulations in a way that's going to work within, you know, within your system and with your institution's culture, that's, you know, one, one kind of question and one kind of idea that, you know, has been floating around. And, you know, in a similar vein, I think, um, you know, another sort of, um, you know, question about framing or level of, of detail to provide or, you know, level of research, um, you, you know, leads you to an area where maybe you think there has to be a shortcut, right? Like you cannot possibly be expected to do all of this research or all of these programs and all of these states um, and, and reach these determinations. And you know, I guess in a way that's that's true. You you aren't right um, because there is that that third bucket, that third option um, where an institution can make you know a, a conscious determination uh, or that's a bad word, a conscious choice to not make a determination. Um, so, you know, in, in, in a sense, that's true. So uh, maybe if you want to call that a shortcut, I, I, I guess it is, um, you know, but what I'm thinking of are shortcuts like relying on or drawing from, um, you know, compacts. And, you know, I think, you know, a, a natural sort of inclination would be to say, you know, look, we are in, um, you know, we offer registered nursing programs and we are in a state that is a member of the the RN compact and therefore we our program qualifies students for for licensure in every other compact state and i think you know there's some logic to that right because you think okay if what a compact effectively does is allows you know someone who is already licensed to qualify you know, or transfer or have you know some special privilege in another state then, then surely that has to, you know, trickle down. Um, but, but really, when you take a, a deeper dive and you think about, you know, what the purpose of a compact is, 
is it really is it's a tool for for folks who are who are already licensed professionals, right? So who are already a, a registered nurse in Virginia, um, and you know need to move to Maryland for some reason, and um, and, and you know are able to uh, facilitate that transfer easier. Uh, what what a contact doesn't do is focus on that initial level of attainment, right? So that that first um, that first RN, that first license, um, a contact doesn't really have any any control or or any authority or any effect there, and and you know that's where these federal disclosures come in. Is you know it's it's focused on that initial licensure question. So not you know does your program you know qualify a student for licensure in state X, and then because state X is a member of a compact, they can then qualify for you know licensure in states you know a b c d e um you know that's that's not it's not how the disclosures are, are framed it's it's not what they're asking right they're asking specific questions about curriculum which compacts really don't get into and i i think that's another area where it seems like a natural fit to say look you know there's a compact and i think you know we can rely on that compact to to make these disclosures and uh, you know unfortunately it's just it's just not that easy um, and, you know, if, if anyone's looking for more information about that, I just want to give a shout out to the WCET um, fan special interest team for professional licensure who published a really great piece recently covering these topics, um, kind of fact and myth and getting into, um, you know, what does a compact do and, you know, how you can think about it and, you know, the interplay with disclosures or, or lack thereof. So. Um, maybe that's old news to you, but I found it was uh, a, a really great piece. And then, you know, kind of kind of moving on from just, you know, making the determination and, you know, making it precise. I think another question as, as you know, institutions go about their research is, you know, there's a lot of requirements for licensure, actually, right? Um, there are um, background checks often, um, you know, fingerprinting requirements, um, you know, a, a number of things that are, you know, all very important to actually qualifying for licensure in a state, but have, you know, really nothing to do with the educational program or, you know, more specifically, um, you know, the program curriculum. And so I think, you know, it's natural to say, hey, you know, while I have this entire list of you know, licensure requirements in front of me, um, you know, I need to include them all in my disclosures, or, you know, I need to make sure that, you know, um, they're reflected some way within this yes, no, um, you know, no determination framework. Um, and, and again, you know, I think maybe in institutions provide this information in other areas, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, really, the, the disclosures, again, um, are, are focused on the program curriculum. Um, and, and that's what the basis of, of the disclosure asks an institution to do, is to, to make a, a yes, a no, or, or to not make a determination about whether the program's curriculum meets a requirement for licensure. Um, not whether, you know, a specific, you know, student checks all of the other boxes for licensure. Um, so, you know, in terms of, you know, providing that additional information, I think, you know, again, you open yourself up um, as an institution to, you know, potential, potential risk and, um, you know, exposure by, you know, providing information beyond what is required and, you know, particularly what is required beyond, you know, this disclosure framework. So I think it's, it's something that I think is, is great for maybe institutions to be aware of and to be informed about and to be able to answer questions about, but in terms of, you know, presenting these disclosures, um, making these, you know, specific disclosures in these categories readily available, uh, you know, do you need to provide or, um, you know, otherwise, you know, link to or summarize these other requirements, you know, that's, it's sort of without of, outside the context of, of these specific disclosures. And so, hey, you know, one- this is, this is Cheryl, can I, can I just ask a, a question here? Sure. Um, you know, just from what I hear you saying from these examples that you've just provided, is that the specific language of the regulation for the disclosures is really important that, uh, that, the, 
that uh, unusual, isn't it, that we actually have a regulation that's really specific. So we can really look, uh, am I accurate to say that we can really look at these regulations and, you know, point out the specifics of what, is, what the institution should be doing? Yeah, I think I think that's right, and I think particularly um, in the in the actual disclosure language, um, when you get down to oh gosh, 668.43 subsection C, where it's actually talking about you know what um, you know the effect that these determinations have and what your obligations are in terms of notifying current and prospective students. I think you know it, the regulation does you know really spell out what what they're looking for you. To, to confirm or to, um, you know, to provide responses to. And it's not, you know, just the, pro I mean, I, I speak very generally about this sometimes, and it's really, really a defect, and it doesn't do the regulation service, because I think, you know, I and a lot of other folks say, does the program meet the requirements for licensure in a particular state? And that's, that's true, that's the gist of it, but, but you're right, that the language really is more precise, and it's really about the curriculum, does the program curriculum meet the educational requirements. So at the end of the day, that's where, you know, it, when you're thinking about all of these kind of ancillary or, um, you know, related requirements for licensure, um, it's a good idea to just, you know, recenter yourself and focus back on the language of the regulation, which is really focused on the program curriculum. So I think, I think that's a really good point. I think that there is, you know, a level of, of specificity here that is helpful and that can be relied upon. Thank you. Um, I think we get, we're going to have a couple of people that would like to ask a couple of questions. So I wanted to give time for that, if you don't mind, um, taking a couple questions from some, some folks on the call. Um, does anybody have any specific questions they'd like to ask at this point? I feel like Caitlin's done a tremendous job, you know, hitting some of the points that I'm hearing from members that have caused them particular concern. So thank you very much, Caitlin, for hitting those. Um, any follow-ups from anybody? You can put it in the chat or please feel free to um, come off mute to ask uh, Caitlin a question. Hi, this is Ann Tornis from Indiana State. Hi, Ann. Hi, how are you? Good, uh, glad you could be with us. Thank you. My question, Nobody seems to have touched on it. Um, in the regulation, it relates to what programs we add in our licensure list. And in the discussion part of the regulations, it speaks to programs which require licensure for employment, but it also refers to programs which are advertised to, like accounting, that you could set for CPA even though you don't need a CPA, you know, as, as an accounting major. So we're having a question about, do we include, oh, and then the final reg, it doesn't speak to like advertising, it just says for employment. So do we take that required for employment as the only list of programs to include? Well, I'm gonna let Caitlin address this, but I think, Ann, you might wanna go back and look at the, at the regulation because it talks about it within the regulation about, um, whether they're uh, whether they were designed or um, um, advertised, it's within the regulation itself. When you look at 668.43 a uh, Romanet five five something like that, um, I think it really does spell out which types of uh, courses are the ones that are subject to these notifications. But um, Caitlin, do you want to correct me there because I may have incorrectly stated that? No, I mean, I think I think that's right. I'm trying to just have it in front of me here so I can control F as you're as you're talking. Um, but it, it is, you know, and, and you're right, actually, and you even got the pin site right, which is uh, astounding. Uh, that's that's wonderful. Uh, but to, to take your, I guess, maybe your second question first, um, the language of the regulation really is, you know, a licensure or certification that is required for employment in an occupation or is is advertised as, as meeting um, you know as meeting such requirements so it was advertised as as leading to licensure um, and again I think um, when kind of kicking around some of these questions it's helpful to think of department's intent and think of a you know a consumer and student protection perspective um, in that you know not only is it important to make sure that the program a student is actually um, taking and maybe is expecting to qualify them for, for licensure 
um, that they have information about whether it does or doesn't, but also if, um, you know, there's an advertising, if you're advertising, you know, a program as, as meeting these, uh, you know, requirements, whether it actually does or not. Um, so I think, yeah, it's important to think of it in that context, and it really does, you know, capture both. It captures the, you know, required for employment, or as, you know, if, if it's being advertised as meeting, um, as meeting those requirements. Um, and again, I think to, to just touch briefly on, on your first question, I, I agree. I think that's really the most kind of challenging part um, of these regulations, at least from my perspective, is, um, is kind of determining the universe of programs that, um, you know, qualify for licensure, lead to licensure, um, I, I think it's a question where, again, it's unhelpful to um, uh, engage with um, you know, a number of folks at an institution to really understand, um, is that the intent of the program? Is that what the curriculum is designed for? Um, I think, you know, obviously there are, you know, programs that are, you know, some, some liberal arts programs, some other programs that maybe aren't so specifically geared towards, um, towards you know, a, a profession. Um, and others that very clearly are. So that's, you know, it's kind of a, a, a not a straightforward answer, but I really, I do think that's the, the challenging question. And I think it um, does require a little bit of, of institutional soul searching um, to really, you know, nail down what the, what the goal of this program is, um, you know, internally, how is it treated? How is it talked about? Um, and to kind of, you know, use that as a, as a jumping off point to, to creating that universe of programs um, that, you're, that you're going to be making disclosures for. That's great. Um, we have got a number of questions here, but I'm going to bring it down to just one question to you, um, Caitlin. Um, and the rest of these questions, uh, I want to encourage people to look back at the, um, at the blog posts that Dan and I have written about a number of these topics uh, when we talk about, um, oh, especially, you know, we, we talk about the uh, determination, I haven't made a determination. And we know that the department has indicated that, um, you know, you could be compliant tomorrow by indicating that um, you have not made a determination in any of the states. However, if you, as we've shared through the, um, the preamble indicated that that could happen, but you know they would encourage you to do a triage method. Certainly, it's a marketing issue because institutions and are some are going to move forward. So students are savvy and they're going to prefer institutions that they can get good information from. So institutions are going to want to move in that direction. Um, they're going to want to uh, provide the uh, contact information for the state board uh, as a um, for federal for as a um, as a best practice but Sarah already asks that as a part of the current 5.2 requirements so there are reasons for that but I'm going to move specifically to the idea of teaching endorsements we may be able to get Caitlin back and uh, talk more on this in, a, in another time so I want Caitlin I'll talk to you about that later but if you could address teaching endorsements today um, I would really appreciate that and then we'll let you let you breathe because we've, we've asked a lot of you today <laughs> well I'm happy to happy to field the questions and again you know happy to um, you know talk to folks you know offline as well um, yeah so, so teaching endorsements I, I think it's certainly an area um, you know, where there are a lot of um, a lot of uncertainty I think it's um, not as easy to um, you know maybe conceptually think about within this framework um, as some other professions. And, you know, admittedly, I am very lucky at Cooley to, uh, to rely on uh, colleagues who not only, um, you know, know these, the teaching endorsement field very well, but actually have a whole um, licensure chart about, you know, where, you know, um, endorsements, endorsement requirements in different states and for, for different, um, you know, for different types of endorsements. So I will admit, I am actually not the best person to speak to um, about teacher endorsements, um, uh, other than to say that, you know, I, I, I ooh, Cheryl, I don't know, this is a tough one. I, no no worries, anything? no worries. We yeah. will um, thank you about the endorsements questions. There's three people that um, indicated that we will um, we'll we'll hunt down that answer and we'll and Caitlin and I will talk about it more too and provide that in the um, in WCET mix. So look forward to um, better 
some more in-depth information about endorsements um, on mix. Okay, so that will be coming up. So Caitlin, you've been tremendous. Thank you so much for addressing this issue with us. It's of concern to everyone. Um, you know, hearing from you specifically about your kind of your idea that it's going to move forward with July one. Um, and it helps us to understand. Um, I, I will point out to everyone that I had submitted to the department asking if there was going to be any sort of delay or enforcement um, flexibility. I have not heard anything back. I communicated with our uh, colleagues at NASFA, the financial aid folks, um, and they had submitted the question as well and have not received a response, but their indication is they have, they think that this will move forward as well, especially given the idea that um, you can choose the um, option of have not made a determination. Again, I urge everyone, if they do that, to include contact information uh, for that state licensing board uh, along with that to meet SARA requirements and also as a best practice. So Caitlin, thanks so much for being on this call. Really appreciate it. And I will be in touch with you um, to follow up on endorsements. That would be great. I, I really appreciate all of the, the great questions and um, I'm not saying this as a joke. You all really make me smarter every time that um, that I talk to you all, and um, it's just a real, a real pleasure. So thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Caitlin. I really appreciate that. And I love that Caitlin did a shout out to our special interest team. That was wonderful. Our, something we were going to talk about a little bit later, but we're going to move a little bit more quickly now through some of the um, updates. Um, the special interest team since our last coordinator uh, call has provided on the SAN website information about compacts, the myths and facts about compacts. Plus um, they have provided the transcript to an interview um, with someone that is a representative representative of the, both the teaching uh, compact and of the nursing compact. It's a, it's a really must read and it's available on the SAN website. Um, Dan, uh, are your, is your audio back up? I'd like to turn the meeting back over to you. Oh, it's back. It's back. And there we go. Yay, Dan. All right, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Um, we're going to go then to Tyson Heath, Western Governors University, to talk a little bit about the new special interest team that will be brewing this summer. It's a great idea that Tyson and others have come up with. Tyson, are you there? I'm not seeing Tyson. So we will, um, in a nutshell, uh, so many of these, um, the regulatory information that you learn is, can only be implemented with good, with good campus buy-in and campus engagement and engagement with leaders on campus has been something that at the institutional level has been something that we've talked about in different contexts for years. And now we are looking to tap into your expertise even more to have a special interest team just coming up with resources on that topic. So Tyson will talk about that some other time. Um, next on the agenda is, Cheryl, did you wanna go or do you want me to do, or, or is it Lisa's turn? Let's go ahead with Lisa. Okay, so the SAN advisory group, which was one of the groups that came up with this special interest team idea, um, as one opening this summer, Catherine Cross from University of Louisville, her two year term is expiring, she is, um, eligible to run again if she would if she would like but um, this summer we are going to have an election for a member of that group which is like just says an advisory group to, to Cheryl and me and a representative body of all of you members um, the election is going to be open for nominations from July 6th to 17 and the voting will take place from July 20th to the 29th so it's a little bit far ahead uh, that seems like 2075 to me in some ways, but we wanted to at least get it out there on your radar and have Lisa Seeker, who's a member of the committee, um, talk a little bit about what they do and to encourage as many people to, to, um, to run as possible. Take it away, Lisa. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, first, I wanted to share a little bit more information about the SAN Advisory Group for any members who might not be familiar with it yet. Um, basically, the group was created a couple of years ago um, to serve as kind of a connection between SAN and the member institutions. And the intent of the group is to provide feedback to SAN on 
programmatic issues or new ideas. Um, we help with some of the planning for CN events and new activities. Um, as far as time commitment for serving on the group, we typically have a phone call to touch base um, about once a quarter and try to coordinate an in-person meeting every year as well. Um, so there's a little bit of preparation and follow-up work that goes along with that. Um, but I, I would really encourage any SAN member who would like to share their experiences with state authorization or share feedback or ideas with SAN to submit a nomination for the open seat on the group. Um, it's a great opportunity to get to know other CM members and to kind of collaborate and learn um, from other group members as well. Um, and I think the goal for the group is to be representative of the CM membership. So whether your institution is large or small, um, or Sarah or non-Sara, or whether you're new or you have a lot of experience with state authorization, um, I think that we would really value having your perspective as part of this group. Um, so again, I would encourage anyone who has time um, and interest to submit a nomination. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the group. And otherwise, I'll turn it back to you, Dan. All right, thank you. Yes, working, working with Lisa is reason enough to try to get on this group. Um, Cheryl, I think you are now going to provide a few updates. Sure. Thanks, Lisa, for that explanation. We're really pleased with having the SAN Advisory Group uh, to give us insight, and uh, it's been um, very helpful. They've helped us direct what our special interest teams should be. And so those have been very productive and we're looking forward to the next special interest team. Uh, a few things that I'd like to share. We had some uh, discussion last month about the Sensational Awards. And I think it's hilarious that Dan just said it feels like what 2075 is is coming up yeah that, that or is a, a, is a, in the future um yes i feel like june 17 must be a million years away but yet june 1 is coming up next week and that just shocks me so that means that june 17 follows soon after that so the sensational award submission period is from june 17 to july 17 and as we talked about last week it would be um it would be great if your institutions would consider submitting their own good work. And so you can look on the SAN website. I think the best place to go is the man, main landing page for SAN awards to look at the sensational awards from previous years. And you can also gain access to the application and the um, information um, about how to submit. Um, is all available on that same landing page. So um, I would take a look at that. All of you are doing such great work and um, here's an opportunity for you to showcase it and for us to recognize you. And we appreciated being able to do that for the last many years. We have three different categories. Uh, one is licensure programs, you know, about how the institution is managing notifications and disclosures. One is location, how to determine. It adds a little extra nuance now that the department has provided direction about how we uh, determine location because we know that we need to meet regulations, uh, federal regulations. We also need to be aware of how we determine location for purposes of SARA compliance for uh, reporting, data reporting, and also for um, uh, being able to know where our students are located for professional licensure. So location really adds new dynamics. So how are you, how are you doing that at your institution? Then finally, a newer uh, area that we started a couple years ago called Compliance Innovations, and it's a catch-all kind of, um, but it provides the opportunity to submit about the tools you've created or the special teams you've created at your institutions or perhaps a policy um, that you've created at your institution that uh, brings in all the key stakeholders. Um, so it's, it's, very, um, it's very open. Um, but it also provides us with some insight into the creativity that the institution has done to be able to manage uh, state authorization compliance. So we look forward to your submissions. We have a team who will be reviewing the submissions um, after July 17, and uh, we will be announcing it in late summer, 
and uh, providing them with an award and notification and, and we're very excited about how we're able to do that. So um, please have a look at that website. Please consider the projects you're doing at your institution and we look forward to those submissions. Um, the SAN membership renewal time is upon us as well. Um, it is amazing that June 1 is, is so soon and we have asked that June 1 be the date that you should provide your changes um, to your membership. That's the deadline. We would appreciate any changes by June 1 because we will be um, releasing invoices after June 1. So we will assume that your status quo and happy to renew you um, after the June 1 um, uh, deadline for changes. So we look forward to a SAN 10. We look forward to SAN 10 with you. And um, so if you have any changes within your membership, please let us know and we will make those adjustments. And you can find that information about the process for renewal on the um, SAN website or you can relocate the uh, item on mix so you can look on mix actually I hope that you all have found that you can you can find um, older um, um, uh, distribution of um, topic areas on the SAN on the excuse me for SAN on mix because your community is the SAN network or SAN coordinator uh, communities and both of those will have the um, previous discussions available so you can review and uh, learn some of the things that we talked about if it's an issue that wasn't something that was of a priority at that time but is now you can go back and see if we've addressed it already before um, and ask follow-up questions so uh, please have a look at that um, something that also just came to our attention is some of you were interested in attending NASAPS NASAPS is you know as we know did not move forward with an in-person conference they have a virtual conference it's a one day three and a half hour conference seventy five dollars is the fee to SAN members there is a code um, this uh, agenda has been updated since the one that that Dan sent out on Friday but it will be on the SAN website uh, probably tomorrow um, and you can get that code and um, the access to register if you're interested the topic areas they um, We'll cover our three different sessions, distance education quality, uh, a session about virtual site visits, and a session on ensuring health and welfare of students and institutions. So you see the main topic area, leading higher ed in the COVID-19 era, and then uh, those three uh, topics will have uh, sessions uh, during the NASAP's virtual conference if you're interested. So that's all on the updates, Dan. I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, great. Um, the I also wanted to touch on a couple of other uh, burning questions here. The sand challenge question that 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 puppy is taking a little rest, may or may not be re resuscitated, unsure. Um, but I do want to take a moment to recognize some new coordinators to the group. So we have Catherine Embry from Teachers College at Columbia University. Laura Henley from University of Alabama, Tim Howard from Columbus State University, Chris Hightower, Chris Hightower from Texas Christian University, and Tarina Caserta from the Nevada System of Higher Ed. Welcome to them all. Hope you'll enjoy this group. Hope people will, will reach out to them. A couple of other quick updates here. We heard about the great work that the Professional Licensure SIT is doing, um, and they are actually looking for some new blood. So June 1st to the 12th, they will have some um, information out for people to, to volunteer to be a part of the group. So there looks like there'll be some kind of questions, uh, an application to fill out June 1 to 12. Um, so if you're looking, for, looking to participate, that would be great. Quick update on the SAN coordinator onboarding project. Um, thank you to the beta testers. Uh, hopefully you should have information now uh, in your email, email about joining that mixed community and plowing your way through that. Um, and I think that is all I have. Anything else, Cheryl? Well, I'm really glad we're able to move forward with that onboarding project. It's one that, that uh, Dan has spent a lot of time with to help people have greater access to and understand the access to the SAN website and what um, it can do for you in terms of the resources. So um, I appreciate the work Dan and the beta testers have put into that. And um, just to say again, the special interest team work 
um, is available on the SAN website. I strongly urge you to, um, to look for that. Again, the homepage of the SAN website is a great first start and uh, you can find um, materials um, you know, throughout. There is a, um, a search guide with the resources and I am pleased to say that um, I would say in the next two to three weeks, we will have a, a search bar on the a main search bar for the whole website, not just the, the uh, research um, search uh, tool that's within the website. There will be a main search bar that's accessible um, for the whole SAN website. So that's coming soon in the next. Carol, it's also it's also linked down there on the agenda um, in connection with the. There you go. Forum in June. So that's well, then I should let's point that out as well. Everybody, um, after you've had a chance to take a look at that, you can ask your questions um, to members of that special interest team about you know what what they found. Um, if you have any follow up questions to the research they provided, so um, I we're really pleased to be able to have them be on the uh, open forum in just a couple weeks. Yep. Any questions from anyone before we go? I know there's still. Federal regulation questions. Caitlin was a trooper um, sticking with us through that. We will follow up on some of these questions that folks asked and you will see answers in mix. Um, but at the same time, are there any SAN member questions to the updates that Dan and I just provided? All righty, not seeing any. So Dan, I'll let you conclude. Thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Um, I'll let my opening joke marinate for another month. Sorry, I missed my, my intro. And um, we look forward to hearing from you in, in any number of ways, uh, whenever is convenient. Thanks again.